eye and then I was about to put it away and then I was just like, and I ripped it. I ripped it. I can't believe I ripped it, but I did. Hi everyone, Kate here with uh, the video every year that I feel like I, I never know um, when to put it up, before favorites, after favorites, but I'm here with my November and December wrap up. I didn't mean for that to happen for me to have to cram two months wrap ups into one video, but here I am doing that. So hopefully it will make me quick on my feet and kind of cut to the chase with what I thought about these books. So first are the nonfiction November uh, books for you. And that is The Lighthouse Stevenson's by Bella Bathurst. That's the first one that I read for nonfiction November. This was an amazing book. Um, to hear about the feats that uh, the Stevenson family, so Robert Louis Stevenson was uh, from this family, um, and kind of a black sheep of the family because he was not at all interested in building lighthouses. Um, but to hear about the ways, the ingenuity that they had with uh, making lighthouses in extremely inhospitable environments, you know, on sheer rock, um, uh, kind of installing lighthouses, it was amazing. And um, I can't remember which particular lighthouse this was, but one of them, they worked for months and months, and then they left for the winter because it was impossible to work there in the winter, right on the coast um, of Scotland where there are so many storms, um, the, the weather is just so tumultuous. There was one lighthouse that the work they had done for months got washed away and they had to start over again. And the tenacity that they had, the creativity. And it was also neat to see um, kind of how a couple of them, they visited different countries. They visited um, France and England um, and to see how lighthouses had been built there and then kind of thinking about the technology that they wanted to use. And also, I had no idea that lighthouses were controversial technology at any point, but it seems like uh, most of the time, at least in Scotland, when there was a shipwreck, it was catch as catch can for any cargo that was there. Um, and even there were many instances of sailors, it was kind of viewed as this kind of hyper-Calvinism, as if anyone, um, it, it, you know, if the ship wrecks, then the sailors are just meant to die. And it was, it was a thing that you did not try to rescue sailors. And even instances of purposely drowning sailors that had maybe were almost ashore and purposely drowning them. It was really harrowing to read about. Um, and it was um, even, there, were, uh, there was one instance of a pastor praying um, during a Sunday service, like, Lord, I pray that this um, storm that's happening now would bring us some, um, uh, some you know, wreckage that we could have. Uh, so it was just very accepted. So then it seems really controversial. Well, why this is, it's always been this way and we get to benefit from this, you know, living in a shore community. Why would you do that? Some really, uh, you know, truth is stranger than fiction is what I get from the nonfiction that I read. And uh, there was one instance where one of the lighthouse keepers, there were two lighthouse keepers and one of the lighthouse keepers died. I think like he hit his head or something. And the other lighthouse keeper didn't want to be accused of murder, so he didn't want it to look like he was hiding the body. So for like a month until somebody came, to, like an inspector, to check on the lighthouse how things were going, he kept this dead body with him for around a month. And I think, I'm pretty sure I remember reading that he went insane after that. I cannot imagine. I, I just can't. Um, also, there was uh, some mysterious cases where People would just randomly have disappeared from lighthouses and they think maybe they went overboard. They're not sure. And then they started a system of they would have to have a minimum of three lighthouse keepers. So you could have someone else's testimony. You know, if one person disappeared, it wouldn't just look like the other lighthouse keeper had done something. There would be at least two other people to kind of comment on what had happened. Um, so, yeah, just to live so isolated being a lighthouse keeper. Um, it was really interesting to read about that, too. Uh, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating, amazing technology. Um, lighthouses, really interesting. Then The Body in the Garden by Katherine Shulman. I took a mystery break and I'm so glad I did. This is a debut mystery and it is a Regency uh, historical mystery setting. And it was fabulous. Lily Adler, I think is her name, Lily Adler, um, is our protagonist. And she is a widow. She's been a widow for a couple years. Uh, and the sting gradually, the sting of grief is coming away and she is, has come to the city. She wants to um, spend some time with some friends 
and uh, while she is there, her, her friends rope her into a lot more socializing and events and parties than she wanted to take part in, but whatever, she does it, and um, also gets to re be reunited with her husband's, one of her husband's very good friends, Jack, and so he kind of accompanies her to this these parties and tries to make them a little bit better, and uh, at one of the parties, there is a body found in the garden. And at that party earlier in the night, Lily overheard a very tense conversation happening with the person who was killed and then someone else, obviously, who was at the party. And so she has to figure out she that, you know, that is the beginning of her amateur sleuthing career. I'm really looking forward to seeing more in this series from Katherine Shellman. It had such great characterization. I was on the edge of my seat. It was pacey. I loved it. So I highly recommend The Body in the Garden if you're looking for a new historical mystery series. And then The Shadow Sister by Lucinda Riley. This is the third in her Seven Sisters series. And I think my favorite thus far out of the series, this does involve um, uh, Beatrix Potter. And so a lot of uh, conservation. And also um, this is the first one that's been in England. So it's interesting because uh, in each book. You know, there's two timelines and one is in the past and uh, it involves World War One somehow. But uh, uh, the first one in Argentina, it's much more kind of uh, second degree experience. There's the, it really um, causes a depression in the economy, but there's much less uh, hands-on experience. In the second one, it's in Norway. And so there is some of the German occupation that you see in that. And it's really heartbreaking. And in this one, some of our main characters go off to war. Uh, so I think World War II is going to be a factor in each of the books and seeing it's really interesting how she's uh, having it come into play because you're in a different country um, in each book. There was also um, the one thing that was a big downside to this is the narrator's choice for the voice for the deaf child. It was so grating. It was so grating. And the few uh, deaf people that I have spoken with do not sound like this. It just, it sounded silly. I don't know why she chose that. So that was a really grating experience listening to the audiobook. Otherwise she was great. Um, and it was neat to have, you know, representation of a deaf child in this and to see kind of the ins and outs of what his life would be like. Um, but that really, I, that was a frustrating experience. So I much more enjoyed the storyline from the past in this just because of that voice choice. Um, but other than that, highly enjoyable. Uh, then I read Murder in Mesopotamia by Agatha Christie. Uh, this was a great Hercule Poirot. I love the series, looking forward to continuing, and it was fun because it was one that you traveled with. This is one um, where there are a bunch of people, uh, you know, tourists visiting, and they're by an archaeological dig. Not all of them are tourists. Some of them are archaeologists. And um, I remembered the episode, and I could remember who the killer was because the killer has a super creepy, weird, like sociopathic type line when they confess to their crime. Um, so I did remember that, but it didn't hinder my enjoyment of it. I'm, you know, I love mystery so much that when I find out, uh, if I find out early who the killer is, I'm not one of those people like, oh, it's ruined, now I know the answer. Like that to me is only part of the enjoyment of reading a mystery. Um, so yeah, really enjoy this one. Liked seeing Poirot traveling and being all um, fussed when his outfits weren't pristine all the time. Then I read Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy. I have some feelings on this book. Okay, I have a confession and some of you might unsubscribe to me after I say this. I ripped this book. That's how mad this book made me. It was like he tried as hard as he could to traumatize the reader as much as he could. I, I felt so attacked. Like, why do you hate me, Thomas Hardy? It was awful. It was awful. And here's the thing, okay? When you read, you hear about Thomas Hardy's two works, Tess of the Gerbervilles, Jude the Obscure, you hear they're the two saddest ones. Well, let me just say here and now, Tess has real problems, okay? Tess has real problems. I felt sympathy for Tess. Jude, Jude is whiny and petulant and is like, I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm going to be so dramatic and I don't ever know what I want. I'm going to change my mind about what I want constantly. Like he did not, 
His problem was himself. Tessa's problems were outside of herself and things that had happened to her. I couldn't stand Jude. So here we have this whole novel where all these awful things are happening. And I'm like, mm, yeah, boy, it really stinks to be you. Gosh, gosh, you know, sorry that happened to you. I just felt I had no sympathy for Jude. And I don't rip books. It was like I let a few weeks go by and then I was about to put it away. And then I was just like, and I ripped it. I ripped it. I can't believe I ripped it. But I did. <sighs> okay. I just like... I read this with Adam from Memento Mori and Kate from the novel Nomad. And when I got to the end, it's like I couldn't even talk about it. I was so mad. I was so mad. At one point, when Jude doesn't get into a school to be a scholar like he wants to, he vandalizes and he paints a Bible verse from Job on the gate to the school. Who does that when they don't get their way? He has a toddler tantrum. He has a tantrum like a toddler and like paint... So, needless to say, did not enjoy Jude the Obscure. Did not enjoy it. And also, can I just say, why do we have to have this false dichotomy that, like, either you work with your hands or you are an intellectual? We need to do away with that, that you, you can only be an intellectual if you have this certification on your hands. The book starts out, and Jude is selling milk. He goes around, he lives with his aunt, he's selling milk. And while he's riding around, the horse is so trained to his route that he's reading books. And then he just is eaten up inside that he isn't taken seriously enough and he doesn't have a certification to say that he's a smart person. And I'm like, dude, that's not a bad gig. Like you have enough food on the table and you get to read all day while you work. Like, what are you whining about so much? So I just really, this idea that especially um, in the West, that you have to have this certification under your belt um, or you're not smart, it just needs to go away. <laughs> like thinking about this contrasted with Anthony Trollope, okay? The man wrote 50 plus novels and in that was not his day job. His day job was being a mail carrier, a postal worker, and he invented the post office box. Let's just think about that contrasted. All right. We'll see how many thumbs down I get from that. Sorry for Judy Obscure fans. Okay, moving on. Um, I didn't think I was going to go off and then I just did. See, I just can't talk about it anymore. Okay. Chronic Illness, Walking by Faith by Esther Smith. Moving on to really uplifting things. This I read with Naomi from um, Naomi's Bookshelf and Christy Lewis Dostoyevsky in Space. It was amazing reading with them. These are two ladies that also struggle with chronic illness. And this to me was kind of the catalyst to start the Fierce Women uh, book club that I'm hosting with Melina and Naomi, um, where we're going to read about women in history who have struggled with chronic illness. This is a devotional. It's uh, you read a little snippet each day. She includes some scripture and then thoughts on how chronic illness relates to that scripture. This was so well thought out. It was not trite in the least. It what just felt I, I really appreciated that it's written by someone who's not like, here's my period of chronic illness and now it's done. It was written by someone who's in the thick of the storm and struggling with the grief that comes every day from feeling not your best and from all of the years that you took your health for granted. It was a really encouraging piece. I'm so glad that I read it with Naomi and Christy. We did several Zoom sessions to kind of process it together. Really encouraging. Glad I bought a copy so I have it now and um, I'll return to it at some, you know, some point in the future. Then uh, speaking of Christy Lewis, uh, Romantic Outlaws by Charlotte Gordon. This was such a fascinating read. This was such a page turner. I don't often feel myself compelled to binge read nonfiction and I could not put this down. This was so gossipy. I got to learn so much about um, Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley. Mary Wollstonecraft is the mother of Mary Shelley, um, but she died a few days after Mary Shelley was born. So they didn't really know each other, but it was interesting to see how the legacy of Mary Wollstonecraft still kind of um, 
came down to Mary Shelley, was received by Mary Shelley through the writings that Mary Wollstonecraft did, and certain things that I didn't realize, um, just how grateful I am to women like Mary Wollstonecraft, where at the time she wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Women, it was scandalous to say that women were, um, had the, you know, the same brain capacity as men. Uh, just scandalous, and she was ostracized for it. Also fascinating to see the time that Mary Wollstonecraft was in Paris at the time of the revolution. Uh, yeah, just, a, it was, a, it was such a good read. I implore you, if you are all like the least bit interested, thank you, Jennifer Brooks, for talking this up so much. Such a delight. Then let's see, it was The Yorkshire Shepherdess by Amanda Owen. This was a really fun audiobook. If you are all interested in shepherding, now I follow Amanda Owen on Instagram. I also follow um, James Rebanks, who is a shepherd in um, the Yorkshire area also, or the Lake District. And then I follow, um, I don't know what her given name is, but on Instagram, she's the Swiss Shepherdess. And I just find it fascinating, this life where your schedule revolves around taking care of these animals and, um, and your year. You have different, you know, with lambing season, you're so busy um, and just constantly doing that. Amanda Owens uh, is just very charming. And she says in this book several times how she doesn't think of herself as tough. And I'm like, lady, you are tough. Like you have seven kids and um, you uh, cook for everyone. She also uh, sells like cream tea is what it's called to uh, people who want to, uh, tourists in the area who kind of want to see sheep farms. Um, and she is just amazing. And she's writing books now. I think she's written several books. There's a whole TV series based, you know, on her life there. And she was just so charming and down to earth. And I definitely recommend it. And then I read It's Not Supposed to Be This Way by Lisa Turkhurst. This to me, I think was the most meaningful book to me this whole year. Um, Lisa Turkhurst does not struggle with chronic illness, but this is a book for any person of faith who's going through a prolonged period of suffering with no end in sight. You know, with my chronic illness, I don't know when and even if it's going to go away. And so to hear from someone who's gone through really tough things, maybe not the same thing as me, but she felt like such um, a friend and companion. And I felt um, equally encouraged while I was reading this, but also equally challenged to really try to be um, okay with the fact that I might not know why this has happened to me, and that's okay. It's okay not to know the answers to everything. So I definitely recommend it. It was just highly encouraging. If you're going through any trials, um, I really think this would be a very encouraging book to read. Then I read aloud The Family Under the Bridge to Peter. This was a very three-star read. I thought it was fine. I kind of had my expectations higher. It is about a homeless man who kind of ends up shepherding, uh, taking in this homeless family. They don't have a father in their family. So he takes them in and um, it's in Paris. So it does have some charm to it, um, but it just didn't kind of blow me away like I thought it was going to. Uh, then I read uh, I Saw Three Ships by Elizabeth Googe. This was a really sweet little Christmas novella, uh, this island um, where three ships come in on Christmas Day and the adventures that this little girl has all in one day. Um, and it's really charming and whimsical. It's Elizabeth Googe, so I loved it. Um, then Mr. Churchill's Secretary by Susan Elia McNeil. This was a really gripping thriller-esque historical mystery. It's set right on the cusp of World War II and we're following our main character uh, Maggie Hope as she is a secretary to Winston Churchill right when things are going down. Um, and it was a really gripping historical mystery wonderful characterization. It was kind of everything I was hoping it was going to be. So I'm so glad when I saw the first six books in the series at a used bookstore, I snapped them right up. Um, I'm really, really glad that I did that. And then Dark Fire by C.J. Sansom. This is the second in the Matthew Shardlake Tudor Historical Mystery Series. And this is another one that felt almost like a thriller. Um, there is a case where it looks so obvious who the killer is, who shoved this boy into a well. It's really sinister. Um, and uh, you really, you, it looks so certain who it is. But Matthew Shardlake, who is our sleuth, says, I don't think things are quite as they seem after he visits this house. He knows something is just, something is amiss. Um, so it's fascinating to see 
him investigate this case. And in the meanwhile, uh, the girl who has been accused of this is uh, she's going to be pressed. And that means literally her body will be pressed. She'll have weight pressed down on her body until she confesses. But he cuts a deal with Oliver Cromwell to delay that if he will find this missing dark fire substance um, that Cromwell had promised to Henry VIII. Can't recommend this enough. Uh, then Kissing Christmas Goodbye by M.C. Beaton, my beloved Agatha Raisin, back uh, with all the snark as usual. I love this series. Can't wait to dive right back into it. Um, just a lovely, delightful Christmas cozy. Then I read Noel Streetfield's Christmas Stories. This was a like three star read. They were charming, but they were a little too charming. They were wrapped up nicely, but a little too neatly and nicely. So fun, sweet Christmas read, um, a little too saccharine for me. Then I read um, 12 Days at Bleakley Manor by Michelle Greep. I do realize this was a bit melodramatic. But if it's in a historical mystery, I realize I don't, if it's in a historical setting, I don't mind melodrama. I think because it seems um, romantic, I don't know why. I, I don't mind it then. Um, this was a really solid, like, Christmas mystery. Um, and it's a bit like, and then there were none, Clue, um, and it has a Christmas setting. It's Victorian. It was a good, like, if you just want a solid Christmas, it's not going to be like this amazing literary feat, but it was a really fun escape for a little while. Uh, and then Black Amber by Phyllis Whitney. I read this with uh, the lovely Brie Hill from Falling for Romance. And it was a middling Phyllis Whitney for me. I didn't love it. I didn't dislike it. Um, it was a really beautiful setting of being in um, Istanbul. Uh, and it was just that the plot relates to smuggled drugs. And I realized recreational drug use, smuggled drugs, never interests me in a plot. I don't know why. Like, it's just, it's, I've never seen it done in a way that interested me. I just lose interest quickly. So it was the fact that the case didn't interest me all that much. Uh, then I read Pre-Raphaelite Girl Gang. This is a really hard book for me to rate because it was so visual and so it was very brief each bit on each woman. I did enjoy it, um, but I never feel kind of this emotional connection with a book like that. But if you are interested in the Pre-Raphaelites, I definitely recommend it. It's uh, just visually very, very stunning and interesting to learn about how many women painters there were that we just haven't heard that much about. Then I read The Christmas Wish by Tilly Tennant. This was alongside, um, uh, I just went blank, Rainy from Rainy Day Reads and Angie from Literary Labors. I have just realized most contemporary romances, it's just so much time is spent on feelings like, does he like me? Doesn't he like me? And I just grew impatient with it. It was fine. It was cute. Uh, but I was kind of happy to be done with it at the end. I got really excited at the beginning and then I just got kind of impatient with the plot. <laughs> um, then I read Dressed for Death by Donna Leone. This is the third in her, our, uh, her Commissario Brunetti series. And uh, uh, again, this one involved uh, kind of some drug use extortion, uh, kind of that sort of plot line doesn't interest me as much. So it wasn't my favorite Brunetti thus far. And also because a big part of why I love this series is um, his wife, Paola, and his daughter and son. Um, and they're such personalities and I love him going home at the end of a hard day and having this, you know, special time with his family and they're on vacation for a lot of the book. Um, so the fact that I didn't love the case and that I missed some of the main characters, it wasn't one of my favorites, but it's still a Brunetti book. I'm really happy I read it and can't wait to continue with the series. Miss Davenport's Christmas by Marion Chesney, aka M.C. Beaton. I think she wrote romances as Marion Chesney and mysteries as M.C. Beaton. I think this was so much fun. It was a Regency romance set at Christmas time. And now I'm really excited to continue with some M.C. Beaton romances because I do like the notion of reading romances, you know, having something um, really easy to dive into, kind of like a mystery, but maybe more relational. And this was 
just what I have always wanted out of romances. So I looked on Hoopla and there are so many audiobooks of uh, Marion Chesney's romances and I can't wait to continue. This was um, involved lots of house parties and um, holiday fun. Two young ladies who are with a Puritan family and through a set of circumstances end up staying with this family that celebrate Christmas, the scandal. Um, and just they come alive in this time. Such, such fun. The next was Cards on the Table by Agatha Christie, the next in the Hercule Poirot series. A uh, really fun, solid Poirot with lots of suspense, twists and turns, had me guessing. Uh, uh, there's a group of people at a house party. They all play bridge and the host at the end of the time in front of the fireplace is found dead. And Poirot investigates. She had me guessing until the end. Um, looking forward to continuing on with Poirot. Then I read Kilbert's Diary by Francis Kilbert, or rather I finished. Um, I will hold it up for you so I don't have to put the picture in later. I really, really liked this. Uh, this is going to be, spoiler, one of my favorite books of the year. So uh, you can hear more thoughts on that in that video because this is getting really long. Um, then I read The Gifts of Reading by Robert McFarland, a really short, slim essay on reading. It brought a tear to my eye and it was beautiful on just what a gift reading is. And I love the specific examples he gave. Um, then Bright Young Dead by Jessica Fellows, a great historical mystery series. I had not read the second one because I was putting it off because I knew it would disappoint me and I'm very happy to be wrong. It did not disappoint me. This was a great mystery. Um, they all go to a birthday party at a fancy English estate and this uh, very misanthropic guest who you have just you really detest him at the point that this party starts, um, is found dead. So there are many people who would be okay with him being dead, and you just have to figure out which one it is. Um, so Pacey. Loved it. Next was No Holly for Miss Quinn by Miss Reed. This is a little, like, 150-page, oh, um, basically a novella, really charming story about um, a woman who's just moved into this cozy house and is excited to spend Christmas there and decorate when her brother, who is a kind of bedraggled vicar, his wife is in the hospital um, ill and he asks if she will come help with the kids. And she comes and ends up really bonding with the family. If you just want a really, really charming, short, sweet Christmas read that's written beautifully, I can't recommend No Holly for Miss Quinn enough. This is, I think, my fourth time reading it and I am still not tired of it. Um, next is Kingdom of the Blind by Louise Penny. This was a middling Armand Gamache mystery for me. It's Armand Gamache, so it was still a delight to be there. But again, with the smuggling the drugs, this thing, it's just immediately, I kind of lose some of my interest. Um, so it is what it is. But uh, it was lovely to be back with those characters, see how things are progressing in Three Pines and um, how the lives of these characters are progressing. And lastly, The Box of Delights by John Macefield. I have a very special video review coming out for you with Peter in it. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that and you can hear more of my thoughts on it there. Oh, all right, I'm done. This video is almost 30 minutes. This is ridiculous, but it is what it is. Thank you for watching as always, and I will be back for another video soon. Bye.